Um, welcome to Fun with Regulations. And so, so here's the people who made it to the end, either very demented or you're, some of you, I know your flights were canceled. Um, so we have that. So I, I do, as we go through this, we do want, we heard before about having fun with some of this stuff. Some of this is decidedly not fun. No, uh, that may be a surprise uh, to, to some of you. But do I, I, as we go through this, I've got all these slides and all these things. But I really wanted to get to what your questions are. If I get to something, I know some of this is complex. And I'll go zipping right past it, just assuming that you know what it is. You know, so stop me and say, what the heck is that? Let's, let's uh, find out. Or, or, or are you saying this? You know, so please do stop me as we go along. And if, you, and if I'm prattling on and I don't see you, do, uh, uh, do shout out and let, let me know. So let's make this uh, uh, interactive and talking about things. Uh, a little bit about me and my organization, WCT, the Wichi Cooperative for Educational Technologies. We're based in uh, Boulder, Colorado. We're part of a regional organization, uh, Western Interstate Commission for Higher Education. Uh, however, that uh, from the start in 1989 that our part of it, uh, the Wichi Cooperative for Educational Technologies, has focused on educational technologies, distance education issues, digital learning issues, and Right away from the start, we had Oklahoma come in, which wasn't a Western state, and so now we have members in all 50 states and in Canada, and so that whole geography thing we don't worry about uh, quite so much. And then for, for me, I remember coming to New York uh, early in, uh, I think it was 2000, back when Who Wants to Be a Millionaire was a big thing, and I got to be on Who Wants to Be a a millionaire back, you remember when they used to have the 10 people on the outside and you had to be fast? And I wasn't, as, you didn't say I wasn't very fast up here at doing, doing this. And so I came in second on one of the questions. I never got to get, uh, go in. So first of all, you know, I'm a big loser on who wants to be a millionaire. That's a, the other thing. The other thing, too, is that something we come back is that some of the things that we were hearing about Paul LeBlanc earlier, that when it's your moment, that be sure to be quick at your moment. And then so I came in second. The guy who came in first won a million dollars. Russ did not. Uh, <laughs> we have that. And so there are, we actually are in this uh, policy area at this time where it is the moment where things are changing and we need your help in terms of trying to make sure that they change in a, in a good way. With that, it lets a little bit about me and my organization. Uh, I want to find out how many of you for your primary role here are faculty people. That's the primary thing that you that you do. Okay, faculty can't afford to come. Okay, I get that. Um, instructional design, your primary thing. Okay, quite a few. Okay, uh, student services in those areas. Uh, librarians. There's got to be librarians. All right, good. Um, uh, just general administration, provosts, and whatever else left in. Is there something else that I didn't get? Some other <coughs> other people in here. Okay, are there people who don't raise hands when the moderator <laughs> says, says raise? Oh, okay, all right, got that. That, that really helps me with that. Some of the things we're going to talk about today, and again, need, need your help with, with some of this. We're going to talk about the big moment that's going on right now is that we're in the middle of what's called the higher education reauthorization. They're changing all the rules. We'll talk a little bit about that, give you an update as to where we are with that. This whole WGU thing I get asked about a lot. What happened with that uh, audit? Uh, and so we'll go through that. Uh, the federal state authorization regulations, we'll talk that, uh, about that. And then about uh, regulations around your tests and assessments and quizzes and things like that and what might happen with that. And at the end, uh, we probably won't get to this, but we'll, uh, that's a, that is a uh, dessert at the end if we get to it is the net neutrality thing. That's probably the first time that sentence has ever been said, that net neutrality is a dessert for anything, anyone. So, so let's get started with, with uh, uh, just some background here. The Higher Education Act was started in 1965. Uh, here's Lyndon Johnson signing it way back then. He was president way, way back then. Some of you remember Lyndon, Lyndon Johnson. Uh, he, uh, and so what they did was that the idea is to uh, try to get all the regulations around, uh, the federal regulations, uh, get those together in one place. And remember that 
higher education is a product in the, in the U.S. and in Canada. It's in, in the U.S. it's a product of the states. In Canada it's a product of the provinces that they oversee it. In the U.S. that any of the regulations really almost are always tied to funding of some sort, whether it be federal financial aid or grants or some other money that you get through, uh, you know, either Title IV or Title II or one of the other, one of the other uh, uh, methods to get you funding. That's how they get you is that it's always tied to some sort of funding thing. And people get confused about that and if they think that the, that the federal government can do whatever they want. Well, they can't. It's, they can only do it because they're influencing you through the funding. You could all decide that you don't want to take federal financial aid tomorrow, but, but you probably won't, won't get that. And so we're at a point where this, is, this bill is usually updated about every five years. The last time it was updated in, was in 2008. Okay, whoops, we're a little far out. We're, we're now at a point where this is probably the longest uh, that this bill, that the act has ever gone without being updated. And so if it's not updated, that means more and more things are outdated in it, right? Have that. And so the, the, um, the House, the House Committee on Education and Workforce came up with uh, uh, this PROSPER bill, which was their first take at what the uh, reauthorization should look at, at. And PROSPER stands for Promoting Real Opportunity, Success, and prosper uh, Prosperity Through Education Reform. And I imagine that a couple of their interns spent a lot of time in a bar coming up with something that spelled out PROSPER. But anyway, uh, and that worked. And I'll also note at the bottom here that you'll get these, you can get these slides later in that for a lot of these things that I put the links in so that you can go back when you're talking to your people uh, back in there and they, can, and they say, well, Russ said this, that you can actually go, and it's not just Russ, it's that you can actually find links to, uh, uh, links to things for all these. And so that bill came out, and I'll talk a little bit about um, some of the aspects of it uh, as we go through the other items. But we do have this handout, and I hope, hope that you uh, got it. And that but it does, uh, it's always good to have little takeaways that give you a, uh, Briefing on a lot of these different things and where we're where we're at, and so we'll go go through that. House, so the House is, uh, has this bill that they have it out there. They're doing. The Senate has been holding hearings for uh, a few years and have, ha have held, held a bunch of hearings so far, and they hope to have a bill out. We might walk out of here. They might have one very soon. But they were taking comments up until last Friday, and I think that they still will will take comments. And I think. Is there anyone, let's see, yeah, I have down here all the states uh, who are uh, in the Senate uh, Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions Committee. Unfortunately, neither New York nor Colorado, where I'm from, uh, have, have people in there, but still do talk to your senators and representatives. It, it, it really does, I'll say this several times, they do listen to constituents. And so if you have opinions about things, do reach out, even as an individual. Now. The, the interesting thing about the two bills, there's a lot of things in the House uh, Prosper version that were written just by one party, just by the uh, Republican Party. They did not talk to the Democrats about it. Things are very different in the Senate side where both because of Senate rules and then also because of the relationship between the chair and then the ranking member is the highest, uh, uh, highest ranking person in the uh, party that's out of, out of power, that's Senator Murray have agreed that they're going to work together on this. And I know that they would like to try to get, uh, like to try to get something going this, this year, but this year does not mean December, uh, because what happens in November? Elections, right? And so uh, their attention starts to go away. If they don't get this passed in the next several, next month or two and really get it earnestly out the door by probably June that they probably won't get back to it this fall. And they take an incredible amount of days off in the summer and in the fall for elections and doing God knows whatever else senators and representatives do and all that. So the next several months and weeks are going to be very important on all this. With that, uh, show this, I didn't, I, it's harder to see here, but the little character up in the top right hand corner, he's kind of kind of behind there. Can you, you know who that is? Anyone know who that Bill? is? Who is it? Bill. Bill. And, and what, what does he tell us about? 
You, yeah, you're just a bill. It's from Schoolhouse Rock in the old, in the old days. And I tell you about the path of a bill and how to do this. Now, what I'm finding is, is that a lot of people who are presidents and provosts and all this came from the sciences or other areas and don't know basic physics or basic civics. Uh, that uh, so I'm hearing things that oh, there's all this stuff in the House Prosper Bill, so that's the way it's going to be. Well, remember that was drawn by one party. It's going to change drastically when it gets over to the Senate, and then they're going to try to try to get it. So we have to uh, remind people about how this how this works. And so uh, you have to update these things. Like so, Schoolhouse Rock was back in what the 70s or something like that. And so this new one that explains how a bill goes through, uh, this new video comes through, and it's done in rap. And when you think rap, you think Utah, right? Definitely. Enjoy. I'd like to take a minute and just sit right there. How a bill becomes law, this is our chain bag. This is short. <laughs> in a legislator's mind, an idea is raised. In the law book is where they spend most of their day. Drafting out, maxing out, hard to relax, and all cool. And I'll introduce some bills inside of the house chambers. For more than a couple of guys, stung with you in the field. Are they making changes in committee on the hill? They may get more of them to fight, but it's just because they care. They say we're moving this bill back to the floor and we'll argue it there. Speaker Hughes whistles for a vote and the answer is clear. And the bill passes and goes over the Senate to hear. If it passes the Senate, then the bill's probably fair. You thought it was law, but it's just not Love quite the hat. there. It goes up to the governor to determine its fate. And if it's good, her might even be signing it later. Look at that bill. It's finally there. Sitting as law, ready to be declared. <laughs> oh, I'm so sad. <laughs> okay. Yes. <laughs> So there you go. Uh, so the, the basic thing. So thank you, uh, Utah House of Representatives. I think uh, for that, uh, that you can use that, and you can you can uh, go get it on on YouTube if you if you wish uh, if you see it again. Uh, that'd be great. But the basic idea: bills have to be passed by both houses, both in Utah and in Congress. Uh, have to be passed by both houses and have to be signed by the president. So you have to wait till it goes through all that to, to get it. But I thought you'd enjoy that. What's all this about Western Governors University? Have you have you heard about this? Is it, uh, uh, what what happened there? Did did anyone uh, have their president or provost say, tell me about it, or what do we need to worry about that? I've had we've had several of our members uh, where they've said. They wanted to stop competency-based education, or that they wanted to, were really worried about this. But uh, this, so this is from September of last year. The Office of Inspector General of the Department of Education did an audit of Western Governors University, um, and uh, looking at their their practices and what they did, and said all they have to do is repay. Uh, they felt that they. Uh, were ineligible for federal aid and that they should repay only $700 billion, which when, actually when you get all through it, it's over a trillion dollars, which I'm sure you all have in your budgets. You know, so this ca caught the attention of a lot of uh, uh, people. So again, Office of Inspector General is sort of a semi-autonomous uh, uh, part of the Department of Education. That really what they do is that they look to see to make sure the Department of Education is actually doing what it's supposed to in enforcing the federal financial aid aid laws, and so uh, some things about that uh, from the final report. This is my favorite sentence from the report, and we've got to read it, right? We did not assess whether the school's model was improving educational quality or expanding access to higher education. 
we are not withdrawing our findings or the corresponding recommendations. So let's dissect that. It didn't matter whether this was quality. It didn't matter whether it expanded access. What matter is is that we wanted to make sure that we were that the school was following a very narrowly prescribed, not well defined set of processes in how that they were operating. Anyone think that's a good idea? A, <laughs> get that. I, uh, so where did this come from? So this all came from back in 1992. Uh, people always want me to point out that there really was a concern about correspondence education, that there was a, a lot of fraud going on at that time uh, with correspondence education. And so they wrote a definition of correspondence education that was quite clearly different from distance education. Uh, because they wanted to uh, lessen the amount of aid that went to correspondence to get rid of that fraud. It's a real problem, and if I make light of this, that it is something that in any solution we still have to make sure we solve about that. However, they put in these words about to support regular and substantive interaction uh, between the students and the instructor in that, with the, with the idea uh, that interaction is less in, in correspondence. And that's where that, that came from, and they applied it in this case. Now the problem is, is that the, de the Department of Education has never done a good job of telling you as an institution what you're supposed to do to comply. See any problem with that? So if you don't know what you're supposed to, <laughs> supposed to be doing, how are you in, in compliance? They have put out some letters that describe it, but, but really, um, I, I run a blog for our organization, wcetfrontiers.org. And I, along with Van Davis, uh, formerly of Blackboard, he's their policy person, used to be at University of Texas System, that we went through you know, all the writings that the department put out, plus all the audit papers, and then put together uh, saying, we think this is what they're saying in terms of what they're looking for. And so uh, this applies to you both, not only with competency-based education, but distance education. And so these things like they want interaction to be initiated by the instructor. That sounds odd to me. That sounds like dissemination, but that's what they're saying, uh, initiated by the instructor. Uh, that it needs to be regular and that they sort of came up with something like at least once a week, something planned once a week in the course uh, was it what they were, seemed to be getting at. Substantive, that so if somebody asks you about financial aid or asks you about homecoming, something like that, that doesn't count. But if they ask you about the meaning of if it's a Shakespeare class and they ask you about something in the meaning of that, that, that counts. And uh, with an instructor that meets accrediting agency standards. And this was a problem for WGU because they use an unbundled faculty model. What does that mean? That means that they have, it's, it's, it's similar uh, to what Karen was talking about where you have one set of faculty who create the master course, you have one set of faculty that are teaching it, you have another set of faculty who are working uh, uh, with the advising and interaction, you have another set of faculty who are doing the assessments, you know, or I say used faculty all the time, but faculty or st staff or somebody. And what they decided to do was that they came back and said that only the one teaching the course is the only one that counts, so all the other interaction doesn't, doesn't count. I just found, always found that interesting how that was defined, regular and substantive interaction, with the focus just on the instructor. What about student-to-student -student interaction and content interaction? Still, to me, the interaction with the instructor could still be equivalent to a correspondence course if it's just one-to-one, -one. sending an email, handing in an assignment. Doesn't define what a classroom, what an online classroom is like in today's day and age. We did not assess the quality of the. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps you missed that that part. I think you're, it's good. Uh, how to get? No, you make good points. And, and when I get with faculty, and I get with people who are running distance ed uh, and online ads, thing, they start thinking about, well, you know, the, all the the fine richness of all these different types of interaction, because because we think about that every day. What they're thinking about is what can we count and what little buckets can we put things in so that we can somehow say whether this is, fits the law or not. And they're not really thinking about quality interaction. And so and that really kind of blows people's minds. But you're, you're exactly right. There's something wrong when we've defined something so that it's not the quality of the interaction. Are we leading towards learning? It's that how it's done and is it done 
how we've prescribed it is what we're counting. I want to say I'm very thankful for this definition because this is at least giving us a baseline um, to inform faculty that it's just not because we think this is a good idea, right, right. but uh, here's a meta reason um, for this to be happening. So um, we're finding this to be very valuable to, to be saying these words. Good. Okay. Let me move along with something. Yeah, so uh, with that, so are any of you going to get hit with a $700 million fine? Probably good to know about it. Oh, the other thing I didn't say about that is that the Office of Inspector General, that that was a recommendation to the Department of, to the main part of the Department of Education. It is fully expected that uh, the main part of the Department of Education will probably reject that. Uh, reject, reject that recommendation. And then somebody asked me in a recent presentation, was that just because of the current administration? I said no, that would probably, that outcome probably would have been the same under the previous administration as well. Uh, just because the, both administrations want to promote distance education, both administrations want to promote correspondence education, and so it set up this interesting tension that we're going to have to, that is only going to have to, my final point down there, Congress is going to have to fix to try to figure out how do we get how do we get past that. But uh, to my other point here is that how does this end up being a problem with you for your uh, financial aid eligibility and all this? Only if more than 50% of your coursework or 50% of your students are declared to be in a correspondence course. So if if the department comes and does a f federal financial aid review, which they do every few years at every institution, you may not know about it because they're off in some little corner doing, doing that, and they start looking into it. And if you have a lot of courses uh, that are distance, and if you have a lot of courses where there's not interaction, and it could reach that 50% mark, that's where, the, the, uh, where that comes in. Otherwise, um, uh, that's an issue. And then um, our advice uh, on this, and it sort of along the lines of what you're saying, is that we had a, wrote a whole blog post, uh, Van Davis and I, about uh, react but don't overreact. This also is a uh, learning opportunity. Is it how can you use this to engage with your faculty in terms of okay, what fits, what is good interaction, and try to uh, try to try to push them along, and then uh, see where you are, and then let your government relations folks know. And so, with that, I get asked about that a lot, and I think I think I'm at the end of the WGU thing. Any other questions about WGU? Oh, the last thing on WGU is that. We've heard from our friends at the National Association of State Financial Aid Administrators that's typically about six months for, a, for the department to rule on these things, so we may be hearing something pretty soon on that. However, this department has almost no policy people, and <laughs> it may take them longer to, to do things, that they're not, they're not appointing, they have not appointed as many uh, people in higher education uh, side of the house as they really need over there, so. Questions on that before I go on? Now for something completely different, and see. Uh, we'll go on to, uh, some people knew, knew what that was. Uh, state authorization reg, uh, state authorization regulations. Now, how, uh, how many of you are at least know a little bit about state authoriz authorization stuff and what, <laughs> what that is? Okay, mixed. So the idea is, and I use maps here because this always helps. Your institution is located in one state for the most part, I mean, you know, for accrediting, business purposes, all these sorts of things. Most of you are in New York. But you might have a student in another state, and regardless of how you reach that student, whether it's at a distance, whether it is that you're holding practica or internships over there, whether you have faculty you know, drive through the tunnel and go over to New Jersey and that they're over there, or you have uh, faculty who are over there and they don't have to drive through the tunnel, but you've employed them over in Jersey, that you are subject to the rules of that state and the uh, authorizations of that state should they have, should they have any. <laughs> Got that? So if you, uh, and it's not, it's not the New York rules, it's where the student is located and it's not the student's residence. What do I mean by residence? Residence is, um, residence would be um, 
you know, where they pay taxes and where, they're, where they vote and, and uh, those sorts of things. It do doesn't have anything to do with that. Is where they're located for the bulk of the instruction that you uh, have for that. And so this has been a, a big issue uh, because the states were sort of blissfully unaware that distance education was growing and growing and growing. And then, uh, and then in 2010, the uh, Department of Education uh, uh, federal Department of Education said, oh, we're going to check to make sure that you're following those state laws as part of your federal financial aid eligibility back in, in 2010. And, and then all of a sudden in the, in the states and the department thought, well, that's, you know, those 18 students who are out there who are studying at a distance, they really were sort of clueless. And the states became aware of it and that there, there was much bigger than that and that the federal government became aware of it. So it's becoming an issue, I'm get it. But we have a question right here. Um, I was at WCET in, over the summer, and the one emphasis that um, I keep ruminating about is that it's not where the student declares their residency, let's say at a point of admission or somewhere along the line, but where they are residing at the point where they are engaged in an online offering with your institution. And so that we need to be monitoring that a little bit more closely. Um, than at the very beginning of their engagement with the institution. True or not true? <laughs> yes, yeah, you need, you need to have some defensible process where you uh, have determined where, when you, de when you determine federal financial aid eligibility that you've determined where the student will be located uh, as they're taking that instruction. Now for, let me use my, I always get quite, let me use my truck driver example. If you have a truck driver who's in, in um, uh, lives in Delaware and does all that, and he drives and he's taking the course the whole time, no state, the federal government doesn't care that you know as he drives all the way to Oregon that he's in each of those states. And so, in that sort of case, it really is the Delaware because that's the home base and where he, where he or she comes comes back to. But for most students, it's that they're located one one place. And it doesn't matter whether you're military or not. I get that question a lot, uh, a lot as well. It is the state laws of the states where, and you, people are going to hate this, where the product is delivered, and education is a product. That that's where the inspector general and the state laws of consumer protection come into into play. Okay. With that, the federal state authorization regulation mentioned in 2010. Uh, and it's had this uh, strange uh, history here, as you can see with my little video uh, that you have here, where it came out in 2010, and then it was set aside by the courts, and then they tried to bring it back, and it was set aside by the courts again, and then it went to negotiated rulemaking, and I was in a uh, uh, negotiated rulemaking uh, panel with the Department of Education where they get they get all sorts of people, and I was representing distance education, and we tried to come up with a new rule, and that failed. And so the department in 2016 issued its own regulation that is set to go into effect July 1st of this year. Um, did you all know about that? Did anyone not know about that? So we need to, need to be looking, looking at that. And so it's been very confusing for uh, presidents and uh, distance ed people that these rules seem to, uh, they're, they're coming and going and a little bit different each side of the federal type. But the key thing to remember is that the states still all have their expectations of you. And really how this all started was is that the federal government was just checking to see whether you were following the state laws. So regardless of whether there's a federal regulation or not, the states will still be checking, checking for all of this, uh, checking to see if your institution's improved in their state. And then there's something called the, uh, let me go on to this, uh, the State Authorization Reciprocity Agreement and that is something that, at least at the institutional level, uh, that if your uh, institution's improved, approved in your home state, then you're <coughs> approved, at least for offering uh, courses in all the other st states that are part of it. And then um, I was part of creating that as well. And in just a few years, that has gone from zero members to 48 to Massachusetts will be the 49th and God knows when California will come on board. And so they, they've got, I, California has its own issues. I don't know if you've ever heard that, but I know. <laughs> uh, so 
it's its own thing out there. So uh, bring that in. So at least at least for that. And, but the only thing about state authorization reciprocity agreement, it's a, for your institutional approval. But how many of you have uh, programs that lead to licensure that you do at a distance or have people go people go out of state for some reason? Those are not covered by Sarah. At least the approved. If there's a separate approval, uh, if you can, you can teach the courses under Sarah, but if there's a separate approval, like you're, you need, um, let's use nursing or psychology, that you might need uh, approval of that of that board as well, uh, the nursing board in each of the states. And this is very very confusing. So anyway, federal state authorization regulations. Some of the things coming up on that. You need to demonstrate that you're going to be in compliance in each of the states in which you serve students. And that can be either by going to each state and getting it or being a member of the State Authorization Reciprocity Agreement, or SARA. Uh, it recognizes uh, uh, reciprocity as a way uh, for that compliance. Um, and there are several new uh, disclosures, and that these are especially for uh, programs that lead, lead to licensure. And the biggest thing is that uh, if you are a New York institution and you enroll somebody from Arkansas, you just to pick a state at random, you know, that, uh, so Arkansas that you have them, and that student wants to go into nursing, that you have to be able to tell that student whether your nursing pro, if it's a, a pre-licensure nursing program, whether your program meets the academic requirements, not all the other personal requirements, there could be a lot of other requirements, meets the academic requirements for the state of Arkansas or Arizona or Alaska or wherever the students come from. This is a real, um, a real pain for institutions, but it, they should be doing it uh, anyway. And then there's some, in, so those sorts of things can be put on your website. That's why they're public disclosures. But there's a couple individual disclosures, and these are things that, let's suppose the students in Arkansas and you know you don't meet the requirements for whatever the reason is. Uh, and the student decides to enroll anyway because they are in the Army. And they know they're going to come back and uh, after the Army that they're going to be a nurse in New York. And so they, they really don't care about the Arkansas law, even though they're, uh, they're stationed there. And so uh, what you have to do is get a, um, uh, a written notice from that student saying that they, you've told them and they understand that when you enroll them. Whether there's this federal law or not, that's a good idea. <laughs> I know some of the institutions really railed against that uh, and thought that was terrible. You know, how could they uh, make us do that? You should be doing that anyway. Let me tell you why, because even regardless of federal laws or anything like that, your biggest thing that can get you uh, is lawsuits from students in professional programs where you haven't revealed to them that they sat through four years of your program. They go and sit for the licensure exam, and then it turns out that they can't sit for the licensure exam in that state. Uh, there's been you know, cases of that sort of thing, and institutions have had to pay. Either had to pay a lot of money to rectify it or pay a lot of money to the students. Because think about that. If I lose four years of my life going through that. So there's, you need to worry about those things. Uh, the federal regulation will go into effect uh, July 1st of this year if they enforce it. Now here's something where I presented on this two days ago and I said I'm pretty sure they won't enforce this given the history of the current administration. Yesterday I received something saying they're coming out with a letter telling how they're going to enforce it. <laughs> so I'm really surprised by that actually because the, uh, this current administration has been doing away with a lot of regulations they don't like. This is one that they don't like. And that Prosper bill that I was telling you before, that they do away with the federal state authorization uh, regulation if that were to get passed. However, it sounds like some version of it is going to go forward and be in place by July 1st of 2018. So we're going to, uh, you probably want to watch our Frontiers blog, wctfrontiers.org, and other things. So we'll be putting out more information about this as we find it out. We have been really pressing the Department of Education to tell us what they're going to do. Because if they're the party of deregulation, don't wait until June 28th, like they did last year with some other regulations, 
and pull the plug on it then because the institutions will have institutions that want to be in compliance will have already done all the work. You know, so it, it doesn't make any sense. Tell us now and tell us what we need to do to be in be in compliance. If they were to end it, remember what I said before, these are state authorization, these are <coughs> state rules. Those rules will still be in place. And there'll be a lot of confusion by um, we've seen this by presidents, and I guess there was just a recent like, provost meeting where somebody said, well, that's all going to go away. Uh, but again, we have to go back to the rap video. One house, it hasn't gone to the president, it hasn't gone to the Senate. Uh, so that they were hearing that, and we were getting all sorts of calls saying, oh, it's going to go away. Well, no, it's not, not yet. Uh, and so so need to uh, worry about that. With that, I'm going to see state authorization, see what other questions you have on that over here any ETA on when Massachusetts is going to join Sarah uh, Matt, when will Massachusetts join Sarah the last I heard was that they're supposed to put in their application in June ish okay. something like that so this summer okay. Uh, okay they've really well they they've taken their time and uh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, putting it in and Maryland and Jersey are in, correct? Maryland and New Jersey are in. Thank so, you. Yep. And then Puerto Rico is looking to come in even. So, But all the other states but California. In California, there's no timeline for them at this point. But Sarah really makes things a lot, a lot easier in all this because instead of having to go to every state and figuring out their rules that you can uh, zip, on, zip on through. And it costs you a little bit, but there's a lot of benefits. Last one I'm really going to uh, go into, I'll go through a little bit quickly, just looking at, at Rest, time here. Question over there. What's that? Oh, sorry. Can you talk a little bit about the SAN network and its benefit? Oh, okay. okay uh, thank you. I get to do an ad for it. No, <laughs> uh, the SAN network, the state authorization network, is something that WCT uh, started. And one of the things that uh, we did that after the rule came out in 2010 and we saw that states and the federal government were going to get more involved with this, that we saw it's a very complex issue. And what happens is that the states are changing the rules and federal government's changing the rules. And so we said, we can do more by working together and networking together and sharing information. Uh, uh, and so we've created this membership uh, organization and either an individual institution could join on their own or like the SUNY system could join and get everybody, everybody uh, into, into, into SUNY to join into that network. But we um, do uh, monthly phone calls for the coordinators. We have a uh, email list where quite often somebody will say, oh, I, you know, I talked to this person at the Department of Education in Kentucky. Has anyone else had the same problem with them or something like that? Or they changed their rule. And so it ends up being a... Uh, uh, an early warning sort of thing that all of a sudden one of the states changed the rules and everybody else starts to uh, figure it out. Uh, and we do, we've done uh, papers on things and, and webinars and, we're, and next week we're filming a little uh, uh, video thing that we're going to, a um, video presentation that we're going to do. So we're keeping people up to date as to what's going on on with that and be happy. Thank you for, for asking about that. With this, uh, Anybody have students who cheat on tests or is, uh, what? You're laughing. Why are you laughing? I was gonna. Good. Well, anyone read the Knicks? And I uh, not not New York Knicks. No, uh, the Knicks. This is one. It was uh, Entertainment Weekly called it their best book of two two years ago, and it's an interesting. It's about a. Uh, the main character is a professor, so you can feel sorry for him. And he has a, a student. You find out more about this student. And on the dog-eared pages that I, that I have in here, the student goes through uh, how in each of her five classes, the ways that she's cheating to go through uh, each, of her, each of her classes. And, I'll get, and I thought it was a, it's a neat little lesson about here's all the different ways that students can cheat. Now, the good news for us is that only one of the five courses is an online course. Uh, that we that we have on that. So it's, uh, I, I, I was reading this, not expecting that in this book, and then uh, found out got lessons on you know new and creative ways to to cheat. Um, it's both the reality that the cheating's going on. The reality is cheating's going on everywhere. 
there's a lot of concern that with distance education, it's a lot easier to do, and we're seeing that from a, a financial aid uh, part of it. And then I apologize, and then I know there's instructional designers in the room, we're going to uh, have all these words, but some of these things it's good to look at the, uh, um, the wording behind this is that in the existing regulation that's out there is that you have to make sure that the student who registers the, for the course is the one who participates in the course or takes the assessments in doing that, that you have some way of doing that. And that's the existing uh, uh, language that's out, out there. And that this gives you some ways that you can, you can meet it. And it's a uh, fairly low bar on a lot of these things in terms of having a, a secure login or proctored exams or some other technology, you know, if you're uh, using Turnitin or one of the many uh, test, test things. And so that those are out there. And it's actually something the accrediting agencies are supposed to be checking to make sure that you have some evidence that you are, uh, are paying attention to this. And so um, had that. Uh, and this is one that, this part of it, I've seen people quote, quote back to me the first parts that I sent you. Um, but I, this one always seems to surprise a lot of people uh, that, that you're supposed to notify students of any projected additional student charges for doing that. And I don't, are, are you doing that? In, in it, doing that? Okay. Are you doing it before they sign up for the course? You are. Good, uh, because that's the requirement. Because we I run into a lot of people, they say, "Well, we tell them once they register," which is not, which, uh, believe it or not, is not the intent of this. Because they want students to know up front that I'm going to have to pay fifty dollars more to take this course, and I'm going to have to buy a camera, and I'm going to have to do all these other things. I'm going to have to seal off my room hermetically so that they can have the camera in there, and nobody, no cat or spouse or anything, can come in and help me cheat or. You know, what are we, you know, are there any other charges that you have in there? So that, that is all in there right now. How much the accrediting agencies are doing, I'm not, I'm not sure, but it is something they're supposed to ask uh, about. There have been, since that regulation came out, there have been two reports. Remember our good friends, the Office of Inspector General? There have been two reports that have come out where they've really taken the department to task about checking for student identity, both for financial aid fraud and then also for what we call academic integrity or for student cheating, cheating on assessments or tests. February 14th, I remember it was February 14th, 2014, that the one on the left, uh, left came out uh, at that. And so the department has 90 days to respond to that from February 4th, 2014. I don't know, they haven't responded. We have, we have no further guidance about what they, what they want to do. So there's these things going out there. And the common wisdom is, is that we'll just take care of it in, where did we start? The Higher Education Reauthorization Act. And so we'll need to watch to see what sort of language goes into, into there. And in fact, in the PROSPER bill, this was something that wasn't in the original bill, but was added as an amendment that nobody saw until the, to the last moment. And it's pretty much the same sort of language that we saw before, that again, back to uh, making sure that it's the same student who participates uh, um, in the, who enrolls, is the one who participates. It's very similar. There's some other things in there that we're wondering what they mean by that language. Uh, but we're looking at, but we'll have to watch to make sure uh, because of, the, of this part here. Beware of the vendors. Do we have any vendors of uh, uh, this software in the in the room? Uh, um, that you know, like the cheating software and all the all this. Uh, Sen Senesis, you know, she's pretty good there at picking <laughs> picking that off. You got it. But if you look really closely at the start right here, you see he's actually you can see the shadow on the bottom right of the guy with the fishing line. Uh, pulling this through, and so you now at first I thought, oh, it's pretty impressive. She caught this snake coming after her, but then it's not really it. Why do I do that? Why do I talk about this? I have seen really scary emails coming out from vendors about the WGU thing says you have to buy our software, <laughs> or the new regulations that are coming out, the Prosper Act says you have to buy our software. You can't do anything else like that. It's not true. <laughs> Again, back to the Utah legislature. The Prosper Act is in law. You know, it's, 
So all, all these all these sorts of things. I, I I do worry that if the vendors get in and put in something in the regulations that um, you know that it's money for them if they can get something that makes them more advantageous. And so again, another thing that we need to be be watching for. Um, let's see. Well, before we get to that, you know, get this. Let's on the academic integrity or the cheating or any of those sorts of things. Uh, the last thing I want to say is that in the Department of Education, and, and I want to see if you have any more questions before I go to the last thing, uh, that one of the things that the Office of Inspector General uh, reports did was that they confused federal financial aid fraud and academic cheating in terms of student identity issues. Now, why is that a problem? And I use the uh, bank analogy. If I go into a bank and create a new uh, account there, I have to bring all sorts of documentation and all this that hel helps me with it. If I go back and I just want to withdraw some cash later, I just have to bring a card or have to be, the barrier is much lower. And I sort of see that the federal financial aid fraud is that uh, if I'm signing up for federal financial aid that I have to provide all this information and that's a, a big money thing whereas the and that is a felony you know if you are trying to steal money from federal financial aid and there are people who do this uh, um, uh, go out and have signed up for online courses just to get the money in and then they go away talk again for a whole other day if you haven't if you haven't looked into that um, but for testing you know that there are, there's just a whole bunch of things just in terms of how you teach, what sort of software you use, or what sort of things that you do. That's kind of a whole different thing. We just want to make sure they don't conflate the two so that you have to do the same thing as if you're setting up a new bank account every time you take a test, right? We don't want to do that. Do that. Uh, questions? Questions? If not, we'll go. All right, we'll play this video and then I'll be done. Net neutrality. Who's sort of net neutrality? <coughs> got this and, and got, got this. Have you seen, who's seen the Whopper video here? I got the, a few people have seen this. So net neutrality is the thing that we need, uh, need to talk about. Why does higher education uh, need to worry about this? This is something where the Federal Communications Commission's really uh, just recently um, <coughs> is doing away with net neutrality. Just had the final vote just uh, a few days ago. And who else but Burger King comes up with the best explanation of what net neutrality is, in case you have not heard about it before. And so let's pray that this works here. Let's see. It was? With net neutrality, you know, some people, for what it's worth, just, you know? I don't know exactly, but it is. Got a number one? Hey, how are you doing? Do you know what number 98, what's going on with it? Number 98, uh, you got the Whopper? Yeah. So you got the slow access Whopper pass? What? It's on, it's on the menu right there with the fast, medium, and slow. Slow MBPS, fast MBPS, or hyper fast MBPS. MBPS, of course, standing for making burgers per second. So if we get the offer now, we have to pay twenty six dollars. Well, that's that's how you get it fast. That's the highest priority. This is like a lane system. So maybe like fifteen, yeah, fast lane, slow lane. So like maybe like fifteen, twenty minutes. What are you talking about? Because <laughs> they can sell more and make more money selling like chicken sandwiches and chicken fries, and now they're slowing down the access to the Whopper. Yeah. Were you given an option of chicken sandwich or? Yeah, yeah, you know, I don't want a chicken sandwich. I don't want a Whopper. Do you have any Whoppers yes. ready that aren't? Yeah. <laughs> the sandwich is ready. I'm just not allowed to actually really get it to you. You can't give me the sandwich. It's ready, but you can't give it to me. The Whopper neutrality was repealed. They voted on it. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, I had no other choice. Oh my God! This is the worst thing I've ever heard of. <laughs> Are you kidding me? You paid twenty six dollars for a Whopper? Yeah, you ordered it. Now he's a higher priority. So. <laughs> you know, oh, guys, I got one burger, man. If you'd like, if this you. This is a bad dream right now. I just want. <laughs> Here's what I'll do. You have the bag. 
and I can put it in the bag in 42 seconds. We don't make the rules. You just enforce these ridiculous rules? Personally, we have to. I felt like I was being taken advantage of in a sense. Just as a customer coming in to get their food, it felt like a power move. They already changed the policies overnight or whatever. Um, I didn't think that a Whopper, ordering a Whopper would really open my eyes up to net neutrality. A Whopper actually told me about net neutrality. It's stupid, but true. <laughs> So, why do we care about that? Uh, the net neutrality uh, ends up being an issue for uh, institutions. So, the idea is that on the net, so that if Comcast wanted to stream the things that it's own uh, uh, much better, that they could do that, or they could sell to YouTube, or they could sell to uh, um, you know some other provider, Hulu or whoever. I can't, I can't remember who owns who anymore. Uh, they could get them so that they get through quicker, they get better access to you. Whereas uh, SUNY purchase, you know, let's say, you know, or one, one of the other ones that are, that are here, Buffalo State, you know, that it's going to be a lot harder for you to match the amount of money to get you to the front of the line and have you uh, get uh, internet access that's equal to those, to those others uh, if it starts to get, uh, to get off. So we need to be paying attention to that and uh, seeing, seeing where that goes. Uh, uh, especially as we start doing more videos and things in our courses, it could end up being a problem. With that, I'm going to end, uh, and I'm going to say, be empowered on all of these things. And you think these are huge things going off someplace else, but when we put out calls and say, give your opinion, we're not going to tell you what to do, we'll give you suggestions about what to say. Uh, we'll get, we can give you suggestions about options on different things. but. Um, volume matters. The people in Congress looked at that, oh, if somebody's writing a whole lot of letters about something, I never thought that the whole thing around the taxes around the grad students, uh, that they'd be able to get that repealed, but in a week, the grad students organized and were able to get their voices and went to Congress and that they, volume mattered, volume matters. Volume both in number of people and being loud about it, that they were able to get that changed. and so. Uh, we need to keep thinking, I wish distance ed was better at coming at this with one voice. We do not do that. I've been trying to work on that. But as we get things out there, we need your help because the only way we get volume is by getting you know all of you involved in this. And so with that, I'm going to end, uh, I think I'm at the end of my time, and thank you all for this and, and, and encourage you to contact me if you have questions. <laughs>